When did you graduate from NISOP? Uh, 87. Okay, so from 1987, just for fun, walk me up through from you graduated from NISOP or maybe right before you got to NISOP. Like what made you say, I think I, this is who I am, this is what I do. Like did you, like who is Dana Smith, photographer, photo illustrator? <laughs> Well, the begin. I, there was never a moment of clarity where I looked and said, "Photography is my life. This is what I want to do." It was a total whim. Mm -hmm. I was doing horrible in college. I was an art major. I spent most of my time. I was focused on playing soccer mm -hmm. at UMass Dartmouth. Okay. Um, you know, I was about to fail out of art school. <laughs> Pretty okay. bad, right? And. Um, and, and photography was something that was forced upon me. I didn't want to do it. I was, it was one of those, like, what am I ever going to do with photography? Why would I, I want to draw? Mm -hmm. And um, it just was okay. And I saw an ad for photography school, and I was doing horrible in college. And I said, well, maybe this is something. And uh, it was a total whim. I got to, I got to NISOP, and I fell in love with it. You son of a bitch. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I wish I could. You know, I, want, I want one of those stories about like, you know, I was six years old and my grandmother gave me a camera. And from that moment on, I was like, no, it was like it was I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, in, you know, the gods up above who mm -hmm. look at this guy and say, like, he's just too stupid to make it on his own. So we'd better intervene here. <laughs> And they pushed me into photography because they figured, you know, this is about all he's capable of doing. That's and, funny. And I ended up at Aesop and I fell in love with it. And and but by total chance. Wow. Because I, my experience was I was in, I was flopping around in college and taking all sorts of classes. I finally majored in anthropology, but I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I want. I had this burning passion to be a photographer. And it was such a huge leap to go to NASOP because I wanted to, I realized if I don't do this, I, it will take me forever to get it. And you. Uh. <laughs> Honest to God. Well, you know, what's funny is that later when Marty asked me to teach, uh -huh. right, you know, and, and uh, you know, she had, she had been asking me, I was like, I don't know, I can't be teaching, I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. and so I decided, it's like, okay, this, so she convinced me, and I said, this would probably be good to try. Yeah. Um, and I said, but I don't have a degree, I don't have anything, mm -hmm. I just have two years of school, and she goes, that's fine. She goes, just, get, just give me a transcript so I can put something in your record, just something. Mm -hmm. So I went to UMass Dartmouth, I got my transcript. And as I'm looking at it, I, I'm looking at the grades, which are pretty bad. And then I look at photography. And in two semesters of photography, I had a C minus and a D. Mm -hmm. And this led me to photography school to become a <laughs> professional photographer. Okay. So, so based on this, so I, I just lied to Martin. I, I said they didn't have my transcript. Oh, that's funny. So I have nothing. I said I couldn't have that. The only thing on my record being a C minus and a D mm -hmm. as a photography teacher. So, yeah, it was pure luck. Oh, well. But, okay, so you go to NISOP. You fall in love with it. And that was 87, did you say? That was, Well, I went into NISOP like 85. Okay, so you... Would have been my junior year if I stayed in college. Okay, so you graduated in, if you, 85, so you got out in 87. 87, yeah. Okay, so you were actually 10 years ahead of me because I graduated NISOP in 1997. Okay. Okay, so that that's an interesting period of time. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that 10 years. Just be like, what was the photo industry like? And not necessarily in a sentimental way, but it was different. Yeah, I, I think I think it was the tail end of the way things had been done for, been going on for about 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I started working out newspaper, with newspapers because I was a uh, photojournalism major. Mm -hmm. said, okay, I get out of school, I go apply to newspapers, and I start mm -hmm. shooting news. Um, but I didn't love that. I, li I liked it. It was fun, but it wasn't what I thought I was going to end up doing. And mm -hmm. I really wanted to be a little more artful, do take a little more time, work on more documentary-type projects. So mm -hmm. I started looking towards magazines. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in that time I was doing newspaper work and a little bit of magazine work, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then in 1995, um, you know, after just kind of walking around New York City and knocking on doors, mm -hmm. uh, I went to Black Star. And uh, I, I'm not sure what it's based upon because I was just very average photographer, but they decided to, uh, they said they would represent me. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, there was no contract really. It was just kind of, 
if you're out there to shoot and we'll when Rick Friedman who is the the photojournalist up mm -hmm. in Boston who had been doing it forever when, when he can't take a job we'll call you and I just uh, that got me in that mm -hmm. opened doors and uh, and that was the tail end of like the golden age of magazine photography mm -hmm. This is when on Friday afternoon, my phone, it wasn't my phone would ring, my pager would mm -hmm. buzz, and I'd have two or three calls from Jobs, mm -hmm. Family Circle, Forbes, Fortune, Sports mm -hmm. Illustrated, all for next week. And they would just line them up. They would just, you know, I thought, yep. this is going to be great. Yeah. It's going to be like this forever. I'll make hundreds of I'm dollars. I'm going to be rich. And, 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 uh, and that was the very end of it. Mm -hmm. um, it was great. And then, you know, right, in, late nine, right around 2000, 2001, yep. it just, the cliff. Yep. We all went right off the cliff. Yep. That was my experience, too. Um, so how did, and a lot of this is, is economic, but I, I will, I will push back and say you are not an average photographer. You always, if, if your stuff isn't necessarily jumping off the page, it always has a very distinctive look. So, like you can, I mean, looking at stuff or images that you've made in the past, and I remember being impressed. Oh wow, he's he's good, you know. Um, and I didn't have stars in my eyes, but it was like that. That's you had visual integrity, as Selena would say. That's a word. Yeah. A okay. That, you're right. Yeah. There's something she would yeah, say. So visual integrity. She was great. Sure. Well, you know, when 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 I say average photographer, I mean I knew I was a better than average photographer, but yeah. in the business I was average. Oh. Nobody would ever notice me and say, "Wow, this guy's going to be something." Yeah. But I was good enough for Black a place like you know a yeah. legendary agency like Blackstar to say, "Yeah, you know, come on board." Well, I think I actually think that I mean we're now at a point, and it's it. it we can, I, I don't want to live too long in the past, um, but it is interesting how back then, you know, you would get like the black book, you know, the, the, and you had, and every, how you talked about yourself, how you presented yourself was you had to really like hit the home run, you know, like with the, you know, with the portfolio and it had to be an ace. You know, and you had, you know, and having to work the phones and, and there was a lot of dumb luck and hard work. Um, and now, and tell me if this is true. It's, it's so different the way people are reaching out to people and how you're connecting. You, you just put stuff on, on Instagram and, and whatever. But I, I think there's, a, I was talking to Francine Weiss about this. Uh, she's the curator down at the Newport Art Museum. And she said, no, I, I start conversations with, Instagram and then it kind of grows from there but all right so we're we're in the early 2000s when the bottom has fallen out and that's when I my assistant I was assisting and hot and heavy assisting um, from you know 97 I was working with David Zadig who yeah right he was he, he fell in love and moved to Norway I remember he, I mean he was you know he was legit yeah he was one of those guys I was chasing oh yeah and I was like I had a goal of um, of working for him and chasing him down and it, it was a lot of I learned and my whole thing was I want to be an amazing printer I spent a lot mm -hmm. of time in the dark room because yeah, right. everyone's gonna love silver prints of course they'll be around forever <laughs> yeah I'll make hundreds of dollars <laughs> yeah but it's and now we're kind of talking about, you know, there's this period in the industry where everything was changing it and there was this digital shift, you know, and how did you respond to that? Uh, you know, reluctantly. Okay. Um, you know, I, I wasn't opposed to it. I mm -hmm. just, you know, unless I was required to do it, I yeah. was probably going to be on the back end of that. Mm -hmm. I was I was never a gear guy. I mm -hmm. never cared about gear, lights. I, I, mm -hmm. I actually, I just hated thinking about it. Okay. I would hire assistants and they would tell me what to buy and mm -hmm. what to use and that's what I would use. Okay. Um, you know, and, and it wasn't required. It was still, you know, it, I was shooting film. I was mm -hmm. still getting film processed as long as I could get it to New York yeah. overnight. It was fine. Mm -hmm. um, and and it only changed when, you know, the expectation we get with digital editors started to become accustomed to getting three or four hundred frames mm -hmm. uh, on their screen, you know, yeah. in in by the next morning. Mm -hmm. And so they said, you can shoot film as long as you want, as long as you know you 
give me three or four hundred frames of what you shoot, which meant three or four hundred scans of what yeah. I shoot. And that changed my direction because there's no way that you can keep up with that. How did that change your approach to the work? Like when you when you have a finite, when you really had to kind of like, when every shot, I didn't don't think it had to count count, but when all of a sudden there was this expectation of we need volume, how did that, and you started to shift into digital, how did that kind of film training translate in a way that made sense? Did you feel like you were a stronger, more economical? I mean, did no, nothing change? No, I, I, I was just wasting more frames. Okay. You know, you're just firing off more. All you right. know, use the motor drive. I mean, uh, you know, everybody has a different process, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, if you look at it as photographers, you know, when we're shooting, sometimes, you know, some people get it, have it in the first 40 or 50 frames. Some mm -hmm. people have to go through 500 frames and then start getting yeah. it somewhere in the middle. I was always, I pretty much, whatever I was going to get, I was going to get in the first 15 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I would just blow through film to make myself feel like I was covering all bases yeah but when i got my film processed all i what i realized is i just had you know a hundred of the same thing yeah i was just repeating myself so that i could pop frames so that it, editors would have what they they would have numbers mm -hmm. but they were still choosing the first 10 or 12 frames which whatever that was fine you know i i never really got better mm -hmm. you know i just okay you know wasted more time so um you know, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, they didn't need 500 frames, but they just needed a lot to throw away. Yeah. With with film, when you're shooting film, you know, you shoot three or four rolls of 120 mm -hmm. in, you know, your half hour. That's that's only 48 frames tops. Yeah. Um, and they were fine with that. But, you know, with hundreds, you're just going to throw away more. It's yeah. just more to edit. But but the, the meat of it is still going to be there. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, it didn't really change for me. As far as work, mm -hmm. because when you you know when you're photographing people, especially important people, CEOs, celebrities, whatever mm -hmm. it was, they're only going to give you 15, 20, 30 minutes anyway. So yeah. you can only fire off so much. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, the quality didn't get any better. Mm -hmm. It didn't really change for me much. I didn't. Uh, there was no drop off, but there was no great rise either. Yeah, I found I got lazier in a lot of ways um, because and. It, it, Coming from working with, you know, David and assisting and thinking every picture that I make has to be somehow enhanced in such a way. And then I re after a while, I, I realized this is crazy. I'm spending hours and hours and hours trying because, and all they wanted was that volume. Right. And it's so it, it and I think it's an interesting conversation, how that conversation has changed and how people were art directors and so forth were relating to work just it just felt different a little bit well there was a lot of change for change's sake yeah if we're going digital yeah. what does that mean well everything's different we're going digital but mm -hmm. the work is still work yeah portraits are still portraits and magazines are still telling stories and mm -hmm. news is still news it's just that everything had to have a different name and mm -hmm. there had to be a different process behind it mm -hmm. um but it, it wasn't necessarily any better. Mm -hmm. Right, the volume changed. Now, I remember we had a conversation. When, I think we were both teaching at NISOP. This was, what, 2018, maybe 2019. And you had something to the effect of, like, you, you were basically out of the game for a little bit for mm -hmm. some reason or not. I forget why. Or you were like, I, I had to take a break. And you were getting back into, like, reintroducing yourself. I forget exactly this scenario. We need, don't need to go into that because what I'm really interested in is after you pick the needle up off the record and you had to put it back down, what was the, how did you build the relationships again or reintroduce yourself to a new market that, you know, because when we were coming up, it was you, you got the Rolodex of the, of the person. Yeah. 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 And it's who you knew. And, and that worked for a while. And then, you know, and not to say that like in 2000 and, you know, the 18 year span of your career, which I think they all have their ups and downs. Mm -hmm. But if you were getting, if you had to kind of like take a break and you came back, I think that there are, it's one of those things where like so much is changing now with technology 
that how people are relating to you as a content, you're not a photographer, you're a content provider kind of deal. And I don't say that cynically. No, no I'm right. You know, but the, I don't think that there's just one change at that level. I think it's changes everywhere. And how do you, so what was that, conver, how did that conversation change for you? It, d does that question make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I was never out of the game, but mm -hmm. you start realizing, just like as you get older in life, you start yeah. realizing like old people, they're not crazy. Mm -hmm. They've just been kind of, they're getting pushed out. Yeah. You know, it's just, you become less relevant. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, well, not me, not this guy. Yeah. I'm always going to be relevant because mm -hmm. I'm paying attention and I'm doing my homework and yeah. I'm working. And I just realized I'm just becoming invisible mm -hmm. because the people that I'm showing work to, the people that I'm asking for work are now 20 and 25 mm -hmm. and I'm now 50. Yeah. You know, and so how does that work? And the answer is it doesn't. Like a, a, a 20, a 25 year old is never going to think the 50 year old is cool. Yeah. They might be amusing. They might be like, good for them for sticking with it. So brave. But they're never going to look and say, wow, this guy knows a lot of stuff and I really like to tap into that. That doesn't happen. So I started thinking, I can't be young and cool and hip. Mm -hmm. I was never, so I don't know why that would start happening yeah. at that age. But what I started to think about is just like the, the process of art, mm -hmm. of always thinking, I can't do what you do. Mm -hmm. I can't do what the people that I, you know, my heroes, my photo heroes, or my mm -hmm. art heroes do. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I can only do what I do. Okay. So what can I offer? that say a cool young hip 25 year old can't mm -hmm. um and i started thinking about those old days mm -hmm. you know and we always hear now it's like well these kids they don't know how to talk to each other because they never have to talk to people they're mm -hmm. always texting and it's mm -hmm. all emails nobody ever has conversations i'm like i used to have conversations mm -hmm. i used to go to new york every six months and have 40 or 50 conversations a week with mm -hmm. all these people that i knocked on their doors and and we had relationships and mm -hmm. they thought oh this guy's kind of cool mm -hmm. I started doing that. I made an old school portfolio. Mm -hmm. Like I went right back to and made prints and I put it in a book mm -hmm. and I started making phone calls the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. And I said, Hey, I'd like to come and see you. And these people are like, for what? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'll show you my work. You know, it's like, see what's going on. They're like, well, I, but I've seen your work. I've seen your website. Just yeah. send me your website. I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, I want to come and talk to you. I want to drive down to Connecticut. I want to mm -hmm. drive to Albany. Okay. So I became a novelty. Right? Yeah. Some guys come in and going to visit me. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I did it the old school way. And I sat down and I would bring them goodies. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm coming from New Bedford or Fall River, I mm -hmm. would bring them Portuguese pastries and linguiça and mm -hmm. whatever. And I would come with a gift in my hand and we'd sit down. And what I realized was these people would sit and we'd, I'd, I'd walk out of there three hours later. Mm -hmm. We had just been talking for three hours because people just don't talk. And, and we were just so starved for conversation. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, my God, it's four o'clock. Mm -hmm. and, and it worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it wasn't phenomenal. It's not like all of a sudden, like, I, you know, my, my phone was ringing off the hook. It's just that I started getting jobs yeah. because I knew how to talk to people. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it, it was just something of a novelty. Mm -hmm. And people thought, that's really cool. I never look at, and, and even the portfolio, just the book, mm -hmm. I never turn pages anymore. Mm -hmm. I never smell print. I never like, look at these neat little things you have in these pockets in your mm -hmm. real portfolio. And, and all of that was something that was left behind. And, but it's something that was still, and the work still has to be good. Yeah. And, you know, it gave me a chance to tell them, and by the way, I've been doing this for 30 years. Mm -hmm. You're not really taking a chance on me. I've yeah. been through it all. You can trust me. You don't, you know, the, 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 the great thing about hiring a 22-year-old for a big job is that they have young, fresh, mm -hmm. exciting ideas. The, the, you know, the risk is that they've never done this before under yeah. pressure. So I can be the veteran. I can be the yeah. savvy veteran who says, look, nobody's going to fluster me. I'm going to get this done for you. Mm -hmm. And I, I brought you pastries, so you kind of owe me. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, that's how putting that needle back, but, it's, but, but you are going back to almost square one. Yeah. There's no picking up sort of in the middle. I used yeah. to tell my students without really knowing this, you know, they would talk, we talked about, probably talk, told your class, you know, I'd say, let me tell you something about promotion. If I start promoting myself for six months, 
they're going to forget me. I'm like mm -hmm. out of the industry. And I, I said that kind of thing because it sounded like, yeah, oh, that's probably, uh, that sounds good. I'll mm -hmm. put a little scare into them and it'll tell them how important it is. Little did I know how truthful mm -hmm. and how accurate that was mm -hmm. because, you know, I was, life takes over things got crazy yeah. i kind of got very lazy and i stopped promoting myself for a year mm -hmm. and it probably took me five years to get back to where i was when i stopped promoting myself yeah even with people you know they're just you're out you're yeah. just oh you i didn't know you were still doing this mm -hmm. I, I never stopped mm -hmm. and uh so it's tough you know and and again you're talking to 25 year olds who i'm just their grandfather basically oh, yeah. and uh you know it's uh it's 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 just always you know the promotion never stops mm -hmm. but it has to evolve the same way that your work has to evolve you can't just i can't go to new york and make phone calls from the street and have people say well if you're here you know come on up mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way anymore nobody yeah. goes in you can't even go into the buildings anymore so yeah. that's gone you mm -hmm. can't do that but how can I find a 2022 version of that? Mm -hmm. um, which is difficult because everybody's just, I, I, I followed you on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I, I know your website. If I need you, we know where yeah. to find you. And But that's so cold and flat and mm -hmm. you're just part of the noise. I think that's it. It's interesting. And this is something that Alex and I talk a lot about and kind of like, how do how can we be genuine? And I like the idea of you kind of, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it, the way it feels comfortable for me. It, so it's relevant. And I, cause I, I started, it, you know, promoting myself and letting people know I existed by like making little prints and just sending them out mm -hmm. little cards. Hey, how's it going? And I, I mean, it's like throwing crumbs in the pond at public garden. I mean, it's just whatever, mm -hmm. but there was this, I'm trying to connect with you. And I think that there's something, what's interesting is how things kind of, the pendulum swings and that that you were a little bit ahead of your time by going back in time because at that point people are like, you know what, I kind of want to have a genuine experience. I want to, like relationships have gotten so easy to manufacture that I want to have a real one and give me a conversation. And you're right, the work still has to be good. And something that, I mean, you're, you're a portrait photographer. And one of the things that I always, it wasn't a critique, but it was just something I noticed when you had your show. It was like, wow, this is really, like, I was, I was one of those kids who was kind of like about the light, mm -hmm. but I wanted to be low-key about it. I was like, this is all just on-camera flash. More or less, like this, but in a way that, it, and I, I look when I was looking at your website when I was preparing for this conversation, I was like, you know what? It's like it's really it's simple and really sophisticated and consistent. I was like, yeah, you sneaky motherfucker. You know? But it fits what I do. Yeah, I I can't do the light show. Yeah, I've never had the patience. I never had the the. I, I just I couldn't learn it. I, yeah. I don't learn that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I first started out, I thought like, you know, especially in like late 80s, 90s, it was very flashy, very oh, yeah. purple skies and yep. harsh light. And, and I was like, I got to do that. But it's mm -hmm. like, that's too much work. It's yeah. too much equipment. Mm -hmm. And um, and I couldn't even kill a shadow. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to kill a shadow. I just create two more. Mm -hmm. And, I, I, you know, I had a rule. It's like I try to kill it once. I'll give it a second shot. If I can't get it in the third shot, it stays. Mm -hmm. And it became part of my work. There were mm -hmm. shadows in my work. And you know, I'm like, look, I can't fix it, so that's gonna have to be my style. Mm -hmm. And I would show it to people, and the editors would look and they'd say, ooh, your work is so edgy. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, well, some people might call it lazy, but yeah. okay, edgy sounds much better. And mm -hmm. I started getting jobs because as the edgy editorial portrait photographer. Mm -hmm. Let's go with it. Yeah, and it, that becomes a style. It's like that's that's who I am. I can't fix the. I, I can't do the light show, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm out of my league with that. So I might as well stick with what I do. And you know, like you, the more time that you spend, you know, the more time I spent with lights and equipment, the mm -hmm. less time I'm spending with that relationship. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the relationship was what I did best. Mm -hmm. That's where my pictures came from. Nobody ever looked at my pictures and said, wow, can he light? Yeah. They would always look and say, there's something about this person. How, mm -hmm. They would always say, how do you get people to do this? Well, the thing that 
I'm thinking is everything in your um, portfolio that I was seeing is like in order, and you can tell that there's some kind of a connection, even though they're not necessarily connecting with with you in the lens. There's a moment of connection or with the space or with the time. It just kind of has this feeling of these people are completely comfortable in their skin right at this moment. It feels like, you know, they, I don't see a whole lot of confrontational portraits made by Dana Smith. There's so, there's like this moment where it feels like your subjects have just exhaled and yeah. they feel safe. If not, if not feeling safe, they feel okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've always thought of it. I, I, I've always thought of photography and especially portrait making as a date. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them is a date. Mm -hmm. And you're going to sit down and, you know, your date is willing to sit down with you mm -hmm. and they're willing to chat. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they've already, you know, they've kind of decided I'm only going this far yeah. and I'm not going to, we're not going to get here or mm -hmm. there tonight. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and the rest is a negotiation. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a chat. And, you know, sometimes you hit it off and mm -hmm. things are going really well. And, you know, it's like, all right, we're off to the races. Although that doesn't necessarily lead to a good picture. No. I think usually you say it's not confrontational, but there's usually a point where you get to where they start to get a little suspicious. Mm -hmm. And they realize, wait a minute, this guy's working me here. Mm -hmm. You know, he's leading me down this path into this place. And he's like, because he has an idea. He wants, at least media savvy people yeah. know this. It's like, you know, he, he knows what he's doing and mm -hmm. I'm not going there. But that conversation, all right, well, maybe I'll go there just yeah. to see where this bastard's going. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and sometimes it's like, I wasn't planning to go here, but I'm going to give it, give it up to you because, yeah. you know, we've had a good conversation. I think, you know, there's mm -hmm. something. And you know it's it's never the same mm -hmm. and lots of times you know i used to always get calls from editors and they say you know they, they give me an assignment to say i want I, I called you to shoot this because this guy's a real prick and so i thought of you hmm. and i'd always think like yeah that's that's good really so that's why you called me mm -hmm. because and it was just because but the thing is i like those people yeah i like the ones that, that they say he's not going to give you anything mm -hmm. or he doesn't even want you there or we had to spend two months just getting 10 yeah. minutes with this guy i love those guys and because it works in pictures even if they even if they end up throwing you out at the end yeah it's that even that kind of you know suspicion or anger or just that you know kind of skepticism that's my picture mm -hmm. that's what i'm looking for and that has nothing to do with lights no or even location necessarily it's about you know how far are we going to go on this date mm -hmm. and and when is the date over and how much time do i have in between those two markers mm -hmm. to make a picture mm -hmm. um and you know and so i think that the light was just i just want to get this over with yeah. so we can get down to the business yeah. And it doesn't get in the way because I think yeah. I know I, you know, I was working and found that all I wanted to do was like light like Annie Leibovitz. And what I realized was that that was just a Ellen Chrome Octobank, mm -hmm. which freed up my mind and it made me feel like a big shot. But it is amazing. It's like there you always hear about like this battle for control, you know, which I never really thought of that much it's like i get it you're here to be photographed you've been photographed before you're going to give me what you're going to want to give me mm -hmm. and i'm not we're not going to reveal the, the truth that we're going to reveal we might not necessarily know until it's done you might give me that little something i don't know but i'm i'm not your enemy i'm not we're not at war here and if you only and i remember um photographing someone and it was I had one roll of 120 so 12 exposures and I could only shoot like 10 shots because it was like we're out of here I was like, mm -hmm. okay but I got the you know I got an interesting shot I and now the person was used to being photographed I think they just gave me their look and I've kind of made peace with that I've photographed people they've been photographed a lot and I know it okay you just do your thing and we're gonna do this and it'll be fine because we're not saving the world here Yep. And I, it's okay. We're, you know, and I, and I respect your time. But that kind of acknowledgement of what it is, I think, opens up another door. But. Yeah. I, 
you know, it's it's a, it's a game. Yeah. You know, when, when people, when a subject, no matter how famous or how well known, when they agree to do this, yeah. You know, they're they're burying themselves in some mm -hmm. way, even if they've done it a thousand times, even if they know the faces and the poses they're going to give you. Mm -hmm. There's still that element of, can I find that little in? Yeah. Can I find can I find that little hole in the Death Star mm -hmm. where I can sneak my missile in there and you know kind of like get that mm -hmm. get them to change their mind? Mm -hmm. And you know, there's no magic formula, and mm -hmm. and I have no special powers, but I think that game that you play in trying to break through the wall mm -hmm. is where the pictures are. Mm -hmm. And it's awkward and sometimes you know they get aggravated and sometimes I get frustrated mm -hmm. and but it's all part it's all part of the game. Yeah. And if you know if you go back to like pictures that you've done over your career or pictures that I've done over my career, you know the least interesting stories is how that picture came to be, mm -hmm. you know, because you always wanted to be like, we sat there and we stared at each other, we yeah. stared it down and we gave us the look. And then finally at the very end, he did this or that. Mm -hmm. And usually it's like, no, actually he was trying to get up. He needed to go to the bathroom, but he couldn't yeah. find his glasses and he was looking and that's why he looked down. Mm -hmm. My light didn't fire, which is why that shadow is on his face. Mm -hmm. And so what looks like some deep, dark, evil yep. moment is actually just a misfire and mm -hmm. he was trying to get out of the frame to answer the doorbell mm -hmm. and you know but that's not very interesting and so you take the credit for it well yes you know i saw something in him and i yes. knew that's what i wanted to do from the very beginning fair now it's interesting all that and now we get into your photo illustration work and how how they are, are you purely photo illustration now I mean, not purely. I'm open to all of it. Okay. But I, the idea of the photo illustration was I thought, like, as a photographer, that, you know, ooh, if I can do photo illustration, well, that broadens my, you know, my offerings. It's mm -hmm. like, well, now I can do both. Um, but the reality of it is that when I made, you know, when people finally, you know, took me seriously enough for the illustrations, all I did was switch lanes. Mm -hmm. They just, they gave me illustration work but they stopped giving me photography work because mm -hmm. they're not going to give the same guy two assignments no. in the same magazine, one for one for each. So I yeah. didn't, uh, you know, I didn't, um, you know, I, I just kind of switched. So I still, you know, do photography, but I can't market both because I don't have time to do both. Yeah. I'm not shooting as much. Do you enjoy the illustration? I love the illustration. Okay. So it's not like, mm. I feel the same way about photography. Like I, I can do it, but shooting video and frees up the bandwidth for me to like do the photography that I have always liked to do, which doesn't really have a whole big market, but like doing, so I don't miss it. I don't miss the commercial. Yeah. So tell me about your photo il illustration process because it is very different. It, it's more involved. I mean, your f photography has always been very spare and simple. And your photo illustration, just by the act of having to make layers and be in Photoshop and everything is very, very intended. It's almost, it's an interesting transition because to get it to look as simple as it does requires a lot of thought. Right. Does that make sense? Well, it, it, yeah, but not the way that I do it. Okay. I talk, mean, talk to I, me about that. I've, like, I've never been an idea guy. Mm-hmm. I'm not the guy who can sit in a meeting, you know, in a, in a producer's meeting and then say like, well, what do you have for ideas for this shoot mm -hmm. or this illustration? I'm like blank. I have mm -hmm. no idea. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard because, you know, when you sit down in front of the blank canvas and you're like, well, I don't know what's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. But again, being true to my process, that's not how I operate. I, mm -hmm. could, I could sit for days and never come up with a single idea or concept. Mm -hmm. So I just start cutting and pasting and moving, and I mm -hmm. just I just make a mess. I press every button, mm -hmm. I move every piece that I can move, and it's just it's a mess. It's chaos. Mm -hmm. But eventually, somewhere out of the chaos, something really exciting is going to happen, mm -hmm. and I can't predict it. Okay, 
and there's no genius behind it. This mm -hmm. is not the crazy artist who know. I mean, it's just if you do enough things and try enough combinations, something's going to end up looking interesting and it's going to trigger something. Mm -hmm. And I'll just look at the way that three things overlap or there's two colors that look really cool together mm -hmm. and that'll get me going. Mm -hmm. And then I'll start working with those two colors and then I'll just cut out a face. And then I was like, well, this is an awful face, but I'll cut the face in half. And now I just got the top of a head mm -hmm. and it just landed on top of the circle that I was just working with. Mm -hmm. It's like, Ooh, that looks kind of nice. It's just, it's so much random, mm -hmm. just, you know, making it, it's collage. Yeah. You can't really do it wrong. No, it's just there's decision making, but yeah. there's I never have. If you ever looked at the sketches I make before I start, mm -hmm. they look nothing like the things that I end up with. Mm -hmm. It's just it gives me something to do until I get rolling. But yeah, once in a while, I'll have a good idea, and I'll be and I'll just get on them. Boom, boom, boom! I'll start moving things around. It's like, mm -hmm. yep, that's what I had in mind. But like one out of a hundred that I actually plan. So. But that process of, you know, because that's what happens, I think, you know, I think about being an older artist versus mm -hmm. a younger artist, right? Yeah. I, I've, I've been teaching at, um, I've been teaching in the, uh, at the Mass Art, uh, they have a three week intensive program for mm -hmm. incoming first years. Mm -hmm. They've never been in college before. This is, it's three weeks before the semester starts. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like a boot camp. Mm -hmm for kids who didn't even have art classes or no experience. And mm -hmm. so I started um, teaching that last year. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, you, you spend three weeks every day for like, you know, six, eight hours. And it's been remote, but mm -hmm. I mean, we're still, and you know, at the end you have to send them out with advice, right? Mm -hmm. What advice would you give this 18 year old as they start out on their journey? Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, I said, I don't know about advice. I said, but you guys, I said, I'm, I'm very, I'm very envious of you. Mm -hmm. I said, because you know nothing. Mm -hmm. And they're like, huh? And I'm like, you know nothing. You have no idea what you're doing or where you're going. You couldn't be any more lost mm -hmm. if you tried. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, this is your pep talk. And mm -hmm. I'd say, but because you know nothing, you'll try everything. Mm -hmm. You don't know what not to do. Mm -hmm. You don't have any shortcuts. You don't even know the long cuts. So you try everything. And that's, to me, like, that's what an artist, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Try everything. You have no idea. Don't eliminate anything. But as we grow as artists, right, as mm -hmm. we do this professionally, we know shortcuts. We know what yeah. we're doing. I'm not going to waste my time with that. We mm -hmm. only have an hour. I'm going to get right to this. And we just run by so much great stuff mm -hmm. looking at, you know, with our eye on the goal. Mm -hmm. um, and with so what ended up happening was, you know, with illustration, photography, you know, I, I started getting really stale. I thought mm -hmm. my work was getting stale. Mm -hmm. It was still fine. Yeah, I still did the job. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, like you said, was, there was people could look and say, oh, I knew that was a Dana Smith. Yeah. Which I don't, I used to take as a compliment. Yeah. But now I look at it and say, that really sounds like a lazy artist. Mm -hmm. If you can look at my image and know right away it's me, it means that I've repeated myself so many hundreds of times mm -hmm. that you recognize it like a McDonald's logo yeah. up on the side of the highway. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, with going back to illustration, I knew nothing. I was back to being 22 years old. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any illustration heroes i'd never taken an illustration class i had mm -hmm. never read a book i knew nothing about it i was totally hacking my way through mm -hmm. so as as ugly as that can be i was also the kid who was willing to try anything and press every button because mm -hmm. i didn't know the right way to do it yeah um and that's really hard to do right when mm -hmm. you get older you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube and I was a kid again, mm -hmm. but it was pretty damn exciting because I knew what it was like to not be that way anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like, what was it? You know, the Freaky Friday or something. Yeah, when yeah, the yeah. adult goes back and now you're a kid, but you know all the stuff that you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the most interesting thing about it is that you know, when I started doing the illustrations, I remembered when I was teaching like workshops, mm -hmm. you know, you know how this goes. You, you have like a, a, a student comes in who's a, you know, biologist mm -hmm. and they come in, but they have a really good eye. They start making pictures. They're making really good pictures. They start getting excited. And, you know, yeah. that's a fun process. Right. Sure. And then the, the student, one student came up to me. And they said, you know, I'm thinking about uh, I'm thinking about kind of switching careers. I'm thinking about giving up the microbiology thing and, and I'm thinking about maybe like, you know, taking a shot at photography. Mm -hmm. 
and I'd be like, oh, oh whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, <laughs> let's let's just you know let's slow down there. Mm -hmm. um, you're making good pictures is very exciting. I understand it. You're a very good photographer, mm -hmm. but trying to do this at this level, and you're going to give up how much per year yeah. and the whole thing in the corner, you know, like be, for that, I wouldn't I yeah. wouldn't suggest this. But I could understand because the enthusiasm, the excitement, mm -hmm. and just the desire to like, I, I, I can do something. Mm -hmm. So I said the same thing to myself when I started doing illustrations. You know, I'm thinking, well, if I start reaching out to these, to my editors and art mm -hmm. directors, the places I work, you know, then maybe I can be an illustrator. And I heard my voice saying, mm -hmm. slow down there, cowboy. Yeah. Maybe you should make a dozen or so illustrations before you start thinking about a career change. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should just, you know, learn a little bit more about this. And I thought, you know, yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting a little too cocky here. But what I started to realize was, you know, because I thought, you know, I would tell I would tell students, I would say, look, you know, I'll show you everything I know about lighting, mm -hmm. and it'll take about two hours. Mm -hmm. I'll teach you everything I know, show all my all my gear, and they say, and then I can light like you. It's like, well, yeah, practice it for 25 years, and you can light yeah. light, light, light just like me. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I don't have 25 years to learn how to be an illustrator. Yeah, I'll be dead by then. You yeah. know, it's like I don't have this. But the thing is, the process, like I was using all my photography muscles mm -hmm. to create illustrations. Mm -hmm. Telling a story is still telling a story. Yep. Building a narrative, setting a tone, setting mm -hmm. a mood, all the things, you know, there's my subject. Do I put them in the middle of the frame or the side of the frame? Mm -hmm. Do they look at the viewer or do they look off to the side? Mm -hmm. Do I make them big or small? Do I make it dark or light? Do mm -hmm. I make it warm or cold? Mm -hmm. All the stuff that I've ever done, spent all my career, in the decision making of photography was exactly the same for these illustrations. Hmm. All the, in, in the end, all I needed to learn was a little more Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And you know, in in the picture of it all, like that's the easiest thing. Yeah, learning the the apps. Like I mean, you can go on YouTube. You can go anywhere. I mean, yeah. you can just sit there long enough and hit enough buttons to learn that. Mm -hmm. That's all I needed to learn was a little more Photoshop. And so when I started reaching out to editors, mm -hmm. they didn't think I was crazy. Mm -hmm. It took them a while because they're like, you're the photographer, right? Mm -hmm. But but I mean, they weren't, I wasn't in over my head. Yeah, I had been an editorial photographer. I knew how to tell stories. I knew how to talk to people. I knew how to get things done. I knew how mm -hmm. to tell a story. I knew how to read a brief. I knew how to checklist. I knew mm -hmm. how to work with editors. I knew how to do revisions, all of it. So there was really, it was just like a, a lane shift. Yeah, it was no big left or right turn or mm -hmm. you know about face. It was just kind of like I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm just not picking up the camera and going to someone's house or going yeah. to a school and making a picture. It's just I'm using somebody else's pictures mm -hmm. or my own. Well, I think about when when you're talking, it's like it, there's so many people who, in that process, they'd stop. And it, like what you said is like they don't know what they don't know and getting to be a kid again and you get to keep all your mistakes and your successes and that but there is this because the, the kind of production timeline gets so collapsed these days. Mm -hmm. um, there's almost no room for play or it feels like there's no room for play. Um, and it's what's interesting when you're you're talking I am now for my fun and kind of getting into the idea of like fiction writing mm -hmm. and part of it is because the pictures that I have in my head that I've always had in my head I can't afford to take <laughs> like <laughs> right. I'm not exactly. Gregory Crudson yeah you know? exactly like I don't have these images I cannot I don't want to cast and light and like get this whole thing I don't want to do a big you know multi-million dollar movie mm -hmm. I just want to tell a story and I'm reminded of um, that it, there's a scene in Ed Wood, the movie with Johnny Depp. And it really hit me. I don't know where he's just Ed Wood, you know, the awful director. Mm -hmm. um, he's like, I just want to tell stories. I was like, God damn, that's me too. Yeah. You know? And I think when you were talking about how like really everything that we're doing here is telling stories. Always. And in the photo illustration, you know, and... and with the photo illustration and with the simplicity of your photography, or not the simplicity, but the f sophistication. Mm, there's a, ooh, hello. But that there's, it's finally being able to do the stuff that's in your head. And if you look at the photo illustrations, I'd say, yeah, they're like Dana Smith is quirky 
Dana Smith is intelligent. Dana Smith has visual integrity. All right. Hey. Yeah. And and there's a sense of play. Like I never I never had the impression like that you took yourself too seriously, but I think that actually you take your work very seriously and you're very passionate about it and you deep, you love it deeply. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very personal. Yeah. But there's this part of like this too shall pass, you know. This is not we're not you know, sending rockets up into the air with this stuff. It's, I'm telling the story about rockets going up in the air in a way that, how do you tell that story in the simplest of way? And so like when I follow your Instagram stuff and I see what the illustration is about, I was like, that's actually kind of cool. Like the one, the most recent one with hot dogs. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's, that's when it gets crazy. Those kind of assignments, like, yeah. you know, FBOs. It's like, I, I, I remember, you know, it's like, what is this? And it's like, I never even knew what this, I have to have the entire thing explained yeah. to me. No, these are like the guys who run the airports inside the airports. Yeah. And I'm like, and they give hot dogs away? And they're like, yeah, like give freebies to try to get pilots to come. I'm like, and they come for hot dogs? Yeah. And you realize like how important, like people will do anything for something free. It's oh, like, yeah. so they're going to land at that airport. They're going to make a trip halfway across the country so they can land this airport because they have free hot dogs. Because you couldn't go to the hot dog stand just off the airport and get, you know, half a dozen of them for five bucks. And, yeah. you know, but, but that's the play, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and it's, it's just so, it's so much fun. You know, I remember when I was a kid every year, because I, I love to draw. So mm -hmm. every Christmas it was like the standard. Some people got a carton of cigarettes. I got a big box of magic markers. Mm -hmm. And it was the whole, you know, there was like, 15 fat ones yeah. and 15 skinny ones. They might throw a metallic one in mm -hmm. there, you know, as like a bonus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would sit there under the, you know, under the tree with all my stuff and I would look at those markers and it would just be like, all the stuff I can make with mm -hmm. this. I don't even know what it's going to be, mm -hmm. but I have all the tools in front of me and who knows. And, mm -hmm. and that's what's happened over the past two years to me. Mm -hmm. I wake up and I sit down in front of the computer screen and I pull up that canvas and I'm thinking, every color is at my disposal. Mm -hmm. Anything I can think of, I can do. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not doing the light show. I'm yeah. not doing, you know, I'm not doing Greg Crudson. I don't mm -hmm. have to do it. I can just think of it mm -hmm. and I can do it. And by the end of the day, it's probably gonna be a mess, but something yeah. really wonderful might happen. And it's, again, I'm not even 22. I'm back to being eight years old with a mm -hmm. new set of crayons, you mm -hmm. know, all new crayons. What can I make today? And, and that's, to me, that becomes the thing that if an editor said, well, what can you give me that these young kids can't give me for mm -hmm. half the budget? And I'd say, because I've been through it all. Yeah. But I still, but so I know all this, but I have the enthusiasm of an eight-year-old. Mm -hmm. And... Honestly, I, this is not a good thing to tell an editor, but it's like, look, I have no idea what I'm going to come up with. Yeah. Because I still don't really know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But it might be really cool. Yeah. So what do you say? And, you know, like you said, I mean, we're not doing heart surgery here, so yeah. no one's going to live or die. If, if it doesn't work out, they're just going to say, we're going in a different direction. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. We won't be talking any yeah. further in the future. And, you know, because I think because it's play, and because it's still exciting and because mm -hmm. it could be anything, I'm just getting the best responses mm -hmm. of just like, wow. And, you know, it, it, what I've been getting a lot lately is people say, you're a very thoughtful photographer. Mm -hmm. I mean, photo illustrator. I keep saying yeah. photographer. but And I'm thinking like a thoughtful illustrator. Mm -hmm. And I think what they're referring to is because I take a brief and mm -hmm. I read the brief. Mm -hmm. They send me the story, I read the story. Mm -hmm. I look for the visuals, mm -hmm. I look to make the connections. I ask them questions mm -hmm. about what the magazine, what the story is about, what's the tone. Mm -hmm. And I plug in all the, you know, all the wires and all mm -hmm. the little outlets. And when they look at this, they're like, wow, this is like really taps into the story. Mm -hmm. But they seem surprised. Mm -hmm. And it just tells me like, yeah, because so much in this technology, one size fits all. Mm -hmm. A 20 year old student just is looking for a style or a technique. Mm -hmm. And once they find that high clarity slider, and mm -hmm. once they realize the lighting patterns and the mm -hmm. formula, it doesn't matter who goes in front of the camera, they're always gonna get that same treatment. Yeah. And from someone who spent a life in editorial, I'm like, well, there's a story here. Yeah. And that's going to determine 
what colors you choose or mm-hmm. the tone or the and you're telling a story and you have to do it in an interesting way in a way that your viewer is going to connect with mm-hmm. but i've become i think like that generation has become a novelty yeah like no one's doing that anymore mm-hmm. reading the story and then mm-hmm. like so you're actually taking visuals from cues from the story yes mm-hmm. wow hmm. great <laughs> like all right cool you know well in kind of winding things up where do you i mean do you it sounds like you're so in the moment with your work so i, I don't like the idea of like asking you where do you think you're going to be like do, you're never going to retire from this they'll they'll peel the pen from your yeah no they'll find me at my desk like you know looking like i'm taking a nap and they'll just realize he's yeah. dead <laughs> i wish that sounded more romantic but that's kind of going to be it yeah you know? well i mean so and there's what i i've really enjoyed hearing and it kind of reinvigorates my faith because like i said i'm 10 years behind you in this process and trying to figure out where do i fit in and i think that's always been an issue for me not that you're my shrink but like where do i fit in and how does my voice kind of resonate um and i've always been very good at getting people what they wanted you know in very mm-hmm. simple ways um and collaborating them i'm a pisces but there's also that getting back to play, yeah. you know, and get it, this is supposed to be fun. And that's something that Alex and I talk about a lot is like, if it's not fun, we shouldn't do it. Right. You know, like if it, we can do anything we want. Alex is an amazing cameraman and just deeply passionate about stuff. And I, w- when I graduated Nisop, I wanted to be the master of all the materials. And I really, I wasn't the, the master, but I really wanted to like come out of there mechanically the best. And, and something that you were talking about reminded me of Tom Pettit, you know, our color teacher, of our course. color teacher. Our, everybody's color teacher. God rest his soul. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the things that we always say was trust the process. Right. And when you were talking about how you just kind of like show up and splash around with images and pixels and whatever, and just, yeah, I don't know. I might get something, I might not, but I'm just going to, I'm in here and it's okay. Like that uncertainty is okay. Yeah. And that I think is, is where I, I kind of need to remain. Like be, being okay, not being okay. It, but it's scary. Yeah. Especially when people are paying you to do what you do. You know, yeah. it's one thing. It's like, you know, you wake up, you you play all day, you make a mess, you go to bed. Who knows? Yeah. Nobody, nobody even knew that you were doing it in the first place. And nobody cared. Yeah. When you get paid for it, it's tough to stay confident yeah. that you're a play. Um, but again, you know, we're not doing brain surgery. So oh. nobody's going to get hurt if we make a mess. No. And the other side of that is that they hired you. That's right. They they want to, they want to have a relationship with you and they uh, and I'm I'm I think something that you you talked about when you were kind of like reintroducing yourself after not promoting for six months or whatever um, was people are just kind of craving connection yeah and they want and that that people are still human with all the technology around us and all the swirling pixels and TikToks and you know whatever platforms snapchats and crazy kids yeah the crazy kids my daughter your kid still love a good conversation in the car Mm -hmm. you know like they there's just that they still love to connect at that personal level and i think that's kind of coming back because now now that we have all these shortcuts we're realizing that the the long way has always been the better way in some ways well, it's, it's more fulfilling. Way. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can do it all online. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I always feel like I can't believe I've worked with somebody for 15 or 20 years, yeah. but I wouldn't know them if I bumped into them on the street. I yeah. just don't even know what they look like yeah. unless, and I can't even magnify their little, you know, their little Gmail mm-hmm. profile picture enough to like, I don't know what she looks like. Mm-hmm. I, I would have no idea. But, but yeah, we do we do crave that, and I and I think that the part about play too is, you, you know, it, it's like we 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 play be, because that's where all the energy is. Yeah, you know, that's that's there's just energy there, and mm-hmm. the more you know, the less you know, you just stop playing because you don't mm-hmm. have time for it. But 
it's just exciting because I think what I've learned is for so much, I'm sure anybody who's ever done this, mm -hmm. is that most of my career I've felt like a fraud. Yes. You know, I've like, thank God that there's no film crew or like that these people who hire me are not walking around with me and watching me mm -hmm. do my thing. Mm -hmm. Because if they had any idea how much winging it is happening here, mm -hmm. they would never trust me. Mm -hmm. But when I when I started to make this transition and like I thought, OK, I'm totally a fraud now. Like yeah. I'm, I'm putting this stuff out. There. I don't know what I'm doing. It's like but because you don't need a license to do what I'm doing, I can just do it. I can yeah. throw my hat in the ring and no one's going to throw it out. Mm -hmm. And then I thought I was fooling people. Mm -hmm. And I just realized like it was the first time in my career that I realized, wait a minute. I learned this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fraud. Mm -hmm. I might not have a plan and I might not be the idea guy and I might not be able yeah. to sketch it up like the movie, like they do in the movies and yeah, come yeah. up to like Don Draper with the yeah. storyboard and all that stuff. But when I get there, mm -hmm. I, I understand, you know, Tom would say, trust the process. I always went to like respect your process. Yeah. My process doesn't look like Tom's or yours mm -hmm. or anybody else's. Just know what you do, know your limitations know your strengths and just respect that if it takes you 500 images to make a you know 500 mm -hmm. frames to make a good picture then make the 500 frames there you go that's your process nobody's mm -hmm. gonna it doesn't matter they only care about that one frame and and for me i just realized wow i've actually been learning throughout this whole life mm -hmm. this whole career i i actually learned this stuff mm -hmm. i do know how to tell a story i do know how to set a tone mm -hmm. i know how to read and i know how to talk to people and I guess I'm not a fraud. Um, okay, and you know, but but there's that that idea, like that that super power that you all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, yeah, like you just said, what I'm thinking about in my head, I can make happen. Yeah, that's my vision, mm -hmm. and someone likes my vision, mm -hmm. and they're going to publish my vision. Yep, and they're going to call me back again to to, to see my vision again, mm -hmm. and then you do feel like the superhero, you know. And it's yeah. it's a little uncomfortable to think like to, to to actually approach the part where you think you know what you're doing because mm -hmm. that seems dangerous to me. It's like I'm much better not knowing what I'm doing because once you know what you're doing, you start to get lazy on the on the on the difficult days. You yeah. know, when things are hard, you're like, ah, oh, I know, I know what they need, I know mm -hmm. what to do, yeah, I know what they're asking for, and you start mailing it in. Yeah. And you can get away. You know, you have to get away with that sometimes. But sure. you have to return to the, like, I got to get myself back in the state of play. Mm -hmm. I think I just saw uh, oh, the designer, New York uh, Shore, Paula Shore. Okay. She did, like, I, I, oh, really famous stuff. Mm -hmm. and she, but I saw her on Abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, have you seen Abstract on yeah. Netflix? Uh, great. To talk to artists about art. Maybe I have seen it. One of the quote, you know, one of the things that I always sit down with a notebook because they always mm -hmm. say it's much greater and better stuff than I do. And she mm -hmm. just said, you know, to be to be an artist, you have to design, you have to be in a constant state of play, mm -hmm. you know, and that just resonated with me. It's like so simple and so mm -hmm. basic. And yet I always go back to, yes, if I'm not playing, it's just going to be stiff and boring and vanilla. Yeah. And unless you're excited about it, and you know, and other people don't even, you know, mm -hmm. you got to get them excited. I mean, there's nothing more, there's nothing that gets you more inspired than watching kids just go nuts over a box or, oh yeah, you know, a popsicle stick. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so I always try to put myself back in that, like, you know, and, and again, I involve my editors, you know, or mm -hmm. the people, the art directors in the process. Yeah, I tell them I'm not sure where this is going. Yeah, but give me another day. Mm -hmm. Give me another day because I think that like something's going to happen. Yeah, and they get excited about that and they feel like they're part of the process and it is a collaboration and and then when everyone's playing, you know that's where it all happens. I think we can end on that. There we go, Dana. This all has right. been great. It's been great to see you. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Two old guys. Yeah. We should wear baseball caps and yeah, back in uh, kids these days, they don't know nothing about nothing. Not a dang.